Welcome to another episode of Forward, the podcast series brought to you by ISS ESG, the responsible investment arm of institutional shareholder services. I'm Mara Souders, your host and communications lead at ISS ESG. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues, Mario Kramer, head of ESG analytics business at ISS ESG, and Dr. Maximilian Horster, head of climate solutions at ISS. Stay tuned as our experts examine whether the issue of climate change should be put on the back burner in a time of pandemic or considered as much a priority as ever. Maria and Max, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Maura, for that introduction. I'd also like to wish a very warm welcome to our listeners today as well. As Maura mentioned, my name is Madia Kramer. I head up ISS's ESG business, and I'm so pleased today to be joined by my esteemed colleague, Max Horster, to discuss probably his favorite topic, climate change. Thank you, Maria. It's a pleasure to be on the podcast. So this novel coronavirus has effectively resulted in a global shutdown of the economy. Goldman Sachs recently predicted that U.S. GDP will drop by roughly 24% this quarter, and recently Bloomberg published scenarios in which all major economies will shrink somewhere between 3 and 5%. As we know, millions have lost their jobs already, and it certainly feels as though there's no end in sight. So Max, considering all of this as a backdrop, I'd love for you to share with us your thoughts. Are we even in a position to afford combating climate change at this point? Yeah, um, thank you, Maria. Yes, indeed. Are we able to afford combating climate change? Well, we have to keep combating climate change. Climate change is not going away because of COVID-19 or because it's not on the front pages anymore. It's actually here more than ever before. We can feel it more than before. You might have seen that the Global Climate Conference, the COP conference this year, has been cancelled because of COVID-19, but that is really only a countermeasure against corona. It is not a testimony to having dropped off the political agenda. And if you follow the latest news, you will see that. Just as a reminder, over the past years, we saw the effects of climate change more than ever before since we measured temperature. Since 1880, when we started to measure temperature, the 10 hottest years took place during the last 15 years. And just the last year, 2019, came on record as the second hottest year since we started measuring temperatures. And 2020, this year that we are in, started off quite badly as well. We saw the hottest January ever on record. February was the second hottest February ever on record globally. And if you look into the different geographies, if you look in the U.S., you know, the Northeast cities, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York City, New Jersey, Connecticut, they all experienced one of the least snowfall ever in that spring. And you might be following that, but I just talked to a farmer in Germany and they are all in despair. While their business is seen as system critical and they're actually asked to continue working despite COVID-19, their business is in huge danger because there hasn't been much rainfall, hardly any rainfall over the past two months. And so the 2020 harvest is actually not endangered by corona, but by, uh, by climate change. And, and this is something that farmers across the globe are facing. So, you know, when we see corona on the front pages of the newspapers, it has just taken a spot that typically is dominated by climate change news. You might remember around end of last year, the change of the year, it was the big bushfires in Australia. Hardly anybody notices that, but the Amazon rainforest is burning more than um, ever before. And these natural catastrophes will continue and accelerate if we tackle them now. We have to tackle them now because if we don't tackle them now, the cost will be much greater in the future. So to me, the question is not if we, are, if we will be able to afford fighting climate change, but if we will be not able to afford it. We have to keep our efforts high there. Yeah, I think that's really interesting and critical perspective, Max. Thanks for sharing that and and all really important points that you raise. But I still sit here and wonder, you know, do you think that this is being seen still at the forefront by businesses, 
by investors, and I'd say perhaps equally importantly by politicians. You know, I guess the question is, will companies and investors see climate change as an essential topic and that really remain in focus? Or do you think that it's really, so to speak, going to become a luxury topic that we pick up in you know, better days down the road? No, absolutely. And I think when I look at this question, it's important to look at politics and the investor's role differently and also the role of the real economy. So if you look at politics, it's actually quite interesting. Just in the last few days, there was the Petersburg dialogue in Bonn, where 30 countries were coming together to address the topic of climate change. And they agreed under the leadership of German Chancellor Angela Merkel, because they will be you know, um, heading the European Council, they agreed that they will not cut down on the climate change budget, but instead accelerate it and increase it. And you know, keep in mind, politics has been the key driver to address climate change before the corona crisis. And investors are very aware of that. Think of the European Union's action plan for sustainable finance that's out there, but also the Green Deal that the new um, head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, put out there. They committed 1 trillion euros over a timeline of 10 years to green the European economy. Yeah, that is definitely massive. And I suppose in contrast, the corona stimulus package that the EU had agreed upon is only about half of that amount, if I recall. Despite that being immediate, of course, and then on top of it layering national stimulus packages, it does certainly still feel like there's a striking difference between those two amounts. Yeah, it's just crazy how these amounts of public spending have reached the trillions and we you know, we don't really stop that much anymore when we read, you know, one trillion, half a trillion. But indeed, it's interesting that the public spending is so high on these both topics, so on climate change and on corona. And there are quite a few voices right now in the mix that say that these two should be tied to each other so that, you know, the corona help, the money that helps to bail out companies that provides, you know, debt financing to company at, at low cost or no cost or so should be tied to also achieving our climate goals. And that is something that doesn't just come from NGOs or so or from, you know, from the green parties in the European Union, but it's actually, I just saw that um, yesterday, you have a group of 50 to 60 companies, you have Allianz on there, Bayer, also IKEA, so Swedish firm, Puma, the sports group, Heidelberg Cement, uh, Unilever is on there, I see. Companies that say, we call up on our politicians, in this case in Germany, to use the corona help, the financial aid that the government provides to make the company more resilient against crisis in general, and especially more resilient against climate crisis. So the argument is that every public euro spent should also aim to transition the economy to a more sustainable one, or at least not boost climate harming activities. So you know, helping activities and not boost climate harming activities. And um, one prominent example that I currently read on in the newspapers is Lufthansa, as many other airlines out there as well. They currently need public money to survive. And there, you know, you hear voices in the public debate in Germany that say, well, wouldn't this be a good moment to, for example, cut down on these domestic flights that in a country like Germany are not really necessary, you know, where you can basically travel by train in the same time from one city to the other? Do we really need that many domestic flights? I don't know if that, you know, will ever lead anywhere, but it's these type of discussions that are going on uh, right now. Well, it certainly sounds like your position here may be that the corona crisis is actually presenting us with an opportunity to address climate change. Well, I would say it is a test right now for the sincerity of what companies are doing on the topic of climate change. You know, is it was it something to just, you know, greenwash or put a lip service out there, make corporate responsibility reports look nicer? Or is it actually something that is sincere? And it seems in many cases to be the latter. And it's also, interestingly, the same for investors. So investors seem to see that this is not the time, you know, this time, this time of crisis and recession that we are facing is not the time to turn away the environmental, social and governance information, and especially the expectations that they have to companies. But on the contrary, to increase their focus on these non-financial factors. Yeah, and actually those non-financial factors 
are increasingly proving to have real financial impact. I think we're uh, certainly seeing and, and hearing from the market. Yeah, and I, I'd also add that we're seeing this play out in our own metrics as a as an ESG data and solutions provider. Um, there's definitely no slowing down in demand for fundamental ESG data from our perspective. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, here in the area of climate change, we are now almost two months into the lockdown models, and you would expect that, you know, demand would maybe slow down because of that, but it's the contrary, you know, the climate-related assessments that investors want to run on their portfolios is at an all-time high for us. But we can also see it with other indicators. You know, if you look at hiring, for example, hiring activities, they came to a hold in many areas. And very often in times of recession, you know, companies let colleagues go who seem to be working in non, you know, business critical areas. And a few years back, if this crisis would have hit us, I bet, you know, it would have also hit those people who work in ESG related topics with investors. But now we see the contrary. Investors keep hiring ESG specialists and these teams are now a critical part of the investment process. So, you know, this is yet another testimony that ESG is the new normal and is the mainstream and helps, especially in times of crisis. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I would say that that is a pretty clear testimony that ESG has hit mainstream mm -hmm. and, and a really critical component to the investment process. Yeah, you know, there are other indicators as well. So if you look at investment products, for example, new investment products, we expect Germany to issue the long-awaited green bond that they've been talking about to finance the green transition of the economy. It's Green bonds in general is an interesting field because, you know, that topic of green bonds led to the topics of social bonds. So, you know, companies that go to the market to raise money and use the proceeds to achieve certain social targets. And there's a new type of bond now in the market that are called COVID-19 bonds. So Corona bonds, if you want, that raise money to address the Corona crisis directly for, you know, research of medication or whatever it is. And these Corona bonds certainly stand at uh, 2 billion US dollars and follow very closely the green bond market structure that we know. So these and other product launches are going ahead despite Corona and sometimes because of Corona. So because the current crisis opens um, opportunities for new ideas and you know new inventions and so on, it helps to steer the ship into a different direction. Yeah, actually, as I hear you say that, it certainly sounds like you're channeling your inner Albert Einstein, Max. I think he was quoted to say something similar. Um, <laughs> so let's go ahead and uh, talk about the time after Corona crisis. So, uh, you know, we can currently observe cleaner air and cleaner water all around the globe, you know, due to the, the pausing of polluting industries, mm -hmm. polluting activities. But, you know, do you think that's really the new normal or, or should we be anticipating a rebound? I mean, it is indeed quite, if you, if you think about it, quite amazing when you think that the, the pausing of the economy of these few weeks results in, you know, these quick environmental recoveries around the world. So, you know, you have polluted rivers, uh, the Ganges or so, that now almost has nearly drinking water quality while before it was it was absolutely polluted and you can see all of a sudden wildlife and fish in areas where they have not been before. But that is certainly not the new normal. I mean, there will be a rebound when the economy picks up again. But it is, of course, a piece in the puzzle. Because I think all these experiences that we make now, you know, to see what the effects of the economy are on the environment, these are, of course, things that businesses, individuals, politicians, um, civil society will remember once this crisis is over. And I also think that these learnings have an effect on the way that we will run um, businesses after Corona. So I think that a lot of businesses and a lot of business leaders might change to more uh, climate friendly operations after Corona as a direct learning from these days that, are, that we are currently in. Yeah, and I guess I'll go on the record and say from an ISS perspective, I definitely think that's going to be the case. I mean, you know, we turned... ISS, a company of a little over 2,000 colleagues in more than 30 global offices 
into a virtual office overnight. I'm on a personal level, I'd say that I'm both pleasantly amazed and really proud to see how well um, that worked at ISS and certainly have no doubt that this experience that we've gone through over the past six or so weeks will prove invaluable as our path forward as a company. And, you know, it's really interesting to see ISS uh, doing this, being able to do this. We can, of course, do this because we are a technology savvy company that where the key business is basically data and insight. So this is something that can be produced and delivered remotely. But I do think that these learnings of, you know, video conferencing rather than flying off uh, home office, rather than sitting in a large office space together and so on, is also an experience more for these more old economy companies that are maybe not that used to, to all the technologies um, that we are using on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think this will, this will be part of the learnings. But I also think that these corona learnings that we are coming from are going much deeper and they might impact actually our global economy's DNA. So we as a firm, we've always, you know, as ISS, we've always operated under this theory of change that, that with the right amount of political will and public pressure and investor action, the real economy can and will be changed for, you know, the greater good of society in the case of my area of expertise, uh, also to combat climate change. So if investors want that, they should be able to impact that. And I must admit that over the past 10 years that I'm working in this field, I had quite often doubts that the world could ever get its act together to actually change course. You know, that's why we say that we try to achieve certain changes. We might not be able to do it because the reality is the way it is. And so we will always just, you know, improve on the margin. And Corona has shown the contrary. Corona has shown that if threat is imminent enough, that the world and mankind can get together and, and can change course. And it gives me hope that we can address the topic of climate change as well. So the threat of climate change, you know, let me remind you, is much bigger than Corona. You know, the potential health and economic damage is much higher than what we see with Corona right now. But when it comes to climate change, we also know much better what we have to do. So when Corona hit us, we were absolutely clueless, right? It's only now that we understand, you know, how social distancing helps and so on. With climate change, we know since decades what it is that we have to do. And the steps are actually less painful of what we're currently doing to fight Corona. So to me, with this blueprint of the Corona measures that we have as a world coming together and saying, let's do the right steps to stop this pandemic disaster, we now have the proof that we can do this as well um, for climate change. And that is actually something that I think is for me and for the world in general, a key learning from these otherwise very daunting times. So one aspect that I thought and find particularly interesting is the fairly massive wave of solidarity that the world has been showing. You know, we put everything on hold to protect the most vulnerable across all societies. And I have got to think that this focus on the most vulnerable could also lead our actions when it comes to climate change. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also a somewhat positive aspect in this terrible times, really, is this reconciliation of generations that we can observe. So in those countries where this um, climate movement Fridays for Future was going on, so where mostly teenagers and students were striking on Fridays, for the climate, these lines of conflict seem to run between the young and the elderly. So there were the young going on the street and saying, you know, we need to stop and combat climate change. And the older generation is sacrificing the youth's future to keep the status quo of the fossil fuel economy. And there was a pushback from many representatives of the elder generation uh, reminding the young that it was this older generation that actually built all that prosperity that now allows the young to protest. So this was, you know, in sometimes a bit hidden, sometimes more obvious, and sometimes even on the front pages of the newspapers, transgenerational conflict. And now with Corona, there is this momentum of kindness and solidarity. The world comes to a standstill to protect the most vulnerable. And we know that in the case of Corona, it's the elderly. And it will cost a lot of money and that will have to pay by the younger generations. And the young generation is okay with that, you know. So those who were on strike for the climate are now okay to basically slow down the economy to help the older generation. And I think that's, you know, a somewhat more positive takeaway from this. And also, I mean, an interesting effect of the slowdown is, of course, that 
it is in line with a lot of what Friday for Futures had asked for, you know, less travel of non-essential traveling and so on. But that is, of course, an unintended side effect of the lockdown. So I guess coming back to the investor side of things here, you know, do you see investors looking at climate change differently in a post-corona world? Well, I don't think they look necessarily differently at climate change than before. The sophistication was already quite high, but we do see that the interest in such non-financial data strongly intensifies with these type of black swan events. You know, Is it possible to understand a company's crisis resilience better by looking into non-financial data? And the logic is always, you know, a company that manages ESG risks well might manage risk in general better. So might manage risk holistically and be a better investment, therefore, overall. You know, a climate resilient company might be better positioned than its competitors in uncertain future. And in the aforementioned, you know, governmental financial aid that is now coming. And if such aid is indeed tied to alignments with climate targets, such data, such climate data that investors can use, you know, can help identify companies that are better positioned to pull through and to uh, quickly recover. So, you know, long answer to your question, investors don't look at climate change differently than before, but more thoroughly. That's at least, you know, the status quo at the end of April. Okay. And so concretely, you know, for our listeners today, you know, would this be checking for the likes of exposure and management of climate transition risks, physical risks, analysis of different types of climate scenarios? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's exactly what you just mentioned. So it's a transition risk, of course, you know, is a company able to transition to this more climate friendly economy? You know, and that could be tied directly to Corona financial aid. What are the physical effects of climate change on these companies? And how is my portfolio faring, you know, in a two degree scenario? And the good news is that this is not complicated anymore. And it's also not expensive. You know, when you, when you use our tool, for example, you can upload portfolios with thousands of companies. We cover well over 20,000 um, companies. You click on your mouse and you download a report that tells you exactly that, you know, which of my investment holdings run higher transition risks than other companies in the same sector overall, what companies emit more greenhouse gases than others, where in my portfolio is the biggest exposure to physical risks of climate change, how is my portfolio exposed to two degree warming scenario, four degree or six degree warming scenario. You know, are you observing then that investors are diving deeper into individual holdings to do deeper assessment, perhaps conduct engagement, or are they actually starting to take action on their portfolios? I mean, you have both, right? It depends really on the DNA of the investor. If you have, you know, concentrated portfolios, investors might dive deeper on individual holdings. If they have, you know, 8,000 holdings in their investments, they might take more a portfolio approach. But it's no question that asset owners are a powerful driver of the demand that we currently see especially when they are long-term investors and want to make sure that their investments will survive and yield strong returns in the climate transitioning economy. There are investors that take action right away based on such reports, you know. What defines climate action, however, then is in the eye of the beholder. So action might look different from one to the other. So you mean an investor really wanting to uh, differentiate between let's say, having impact versus wanting to address risk or, you know, even as the case may be, identifying alpha opportunities. Correct, correct. The differentiation between risk and impact is one that is quite important because it basically requires you to look at different type of data sets. But if you want to ensure that climate risk doesn't hit your equity portfolio, you can, of course, trade out of certain climate risky companies and invest in those climate transition opportunities that you can identify from such data. So if climate risks unfold, your investments might get hit less because you are not exposed to them, right? If you, on the other hand, want to ensure to have an impact on the real economy, meaning that through your investments, there will be less greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere later on, you can use different type of information to, for example, engage with company leadership Or you can even make use of your voting rights, of course. Well, uh, I have to say that I find the voting option particularly exciting. And I'm not saying that just because I'm an ISS veteran, 
there's no doubt investors can make their voices heard in the boardroom through the power of a shareholder vote. Yeah, and that is really a big game changer out there now with these climate voting services that we came out end of last year. This is actually pretty easy now. As an investor, you get a climate risk snapshot. We call that a climate awareness scorecard that tells you about the individual climate performance of that very company. And if that company is, for example, not transitioning to a greener economy in line with your expectations, as an investor, you can now you know, vote against individual directors, uh, certain bonus payments or other agenda items at the annual general meeting. That is a huge game changer out there that, that everyone should look at, I find. Yeah, and I know this was a big area of focus for you and your team in terms of uh, assisting investors yeah. to to be able to uh, voice their you know climate concerns or feedback to companies through the vote. So I definitely know you're excited about this one. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, this was part of our logic already th- three years ago when we joined ISS with the entire team and built the climate offering. And with this offering now, the investor world looks massively different than in the beginning of last year. You know, it took us almost a year to develop this really, but now it's there. Investors can impact the real economy for running less climate risk or even changing for the greater good of society, whatever their driver is. They can impact that economy out there on the topic of climate change. And that is the theory of change that gets me up every morning, because if the world does it right, we will be able to address climate change through portfolio holdings. And we will see much more of that once the corona crisis is over, I'm sure. So as a climate expert, Max, it sounds like you remain positive on the outlook for investors' action on climate change despite the coronavirus. Well, on good days and in good moments like this one. But I would say, yes, I'm cautiously optimistic. So hopefully we will be able to look back at the year 2020 and we will be able to say, while it was terrible, And while the damages were hurtful, investors in politics and businesses aligned to use this corona crisis as a chance to change course on the topic of climate change. This terrible crisis paves the way for a much better future, a promising and pleasant thought for us to end today's podcast on. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much, Maria. What interesting perspectives. An optimistic outlook is certainly refreshing. Thank you for taking the time to share your insights, Maria and Max. For questions on this episode's topic, feel free to reach out to our experts by email at podcast at iss-esg.com. And to stay up to speed on the latest with ISS ESG, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter at ISS ESG. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to tune in next time to ISS ESG Forward. (laughs) 